So we get outdoors nation. Uh, it's my delight today to uh, introduce Thor F. Jensen to our podcast to talk about his book, Saltwater and Spear Tips, a 13 month expedition around Papua New Guinea, sea kayaking around Denmark, living in Australia, fighting with pirates, dodging monsoons, and anything else outdoors. Um, Thor, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks so much, Rob. <laughs> It's super cool to have you here. Now, I, I have to talk, ask you about the elephant in the room. It's become painfully apparent to me we've got a Danish guy living in Australia. Like, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, man, but that, that, that's what happens when you, like, travel around and meet people and stuff. Uh, so it's actually my partner. She's Australian, um, and she's an anthropologist. And I actually met her in Papua New Guinea on this great expedition we're also going to talk about. Uh, but anyways... Um, we ended up here in the outback in the middle of uh, Australia, Alice Springs. And uh, it's amazing here. Like, I never lived in the desert. Uh, like, I'm from Copenhagen. Uh, so, like, I've always lived by the sea and always, like, got a lot of, uh, you know, uh, water sports and things like that. And then now suddenly I'm in this, like, big, red, dry desert. <laughs> uh, so I really like uh, like the, the change <laughs> I've seen. Very exciting. And uh the weather's a bit nicer there this time of year than in Denmark, eh? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like it's it's still nice and warm and stuff, but um, but at night it it's actually getting uh, quite cold now because uh, down here in the southern hemisphere it's it's becoming winter. Uh, that's true. Nights are getting cold. That's that's very very true. So, where did all your adventures in the outdoors begin? Um, you've you've done a thirteen month expedition like around Papua New Guinea. What what was it in your like childhood or something that that inspired you to start getting outdoors and going paddling, canoeing, kayaking, sailing? What was it? Um, I think like I have a bit of an unconventional background. Uh, like although you know I did go sailing when I was a kid and did some like outdoor outdoors camping stuff with my parents as well, but. Uh, um, like the real kind of adventure for me uh, started with the uh, graffiti actually. Um, so uh, I, I, yeah, I was a, a very keen graffiti painter in Copenhagen uh, from when I was uh, 13 uh, and onwards. And I've always been very creative and I always wanted, you know, action and adventure. And then like, if you, if you live in the big city, uh, graffiti is the obvious choice. Um, but of course, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, but but of course, as I grew older, you know, I kind of you know started to reflect on uh, what I was doing, and and you know, it wasn't completely legal, and and like all this, uh, you know, being chased by the police and stuff. Um, I, I thought, you know, like maybe I should uh, spend my energy and talent on uh, something, uh, you know. Uh, you know a bit uh, better for the greater good of humankind you know than just like my own ego um and that's how i kind of got into uh, to the outdoors and uh, so when i was 21 i uh, did this uh, course in the uh, like outdoors like all these uh, basic disciplines uh, kayaking uh, rock climbing and, and all that stuff uh, hiking uh, skiing you know like winter fjellum and all that stuff and um that, that that was kind of, uh, you know, like where I really, you know, got into it. And, um, you know, I've also learned how to, uh, what, what do you say, like, you know, share the outdoors with, with other people. Mm. Um, so so that, was a, that was a good uh, good change of, of scene. And I still got the, the action, you know. <laughs> was, yeah, you do, indeed. Was, was there a tipping point in particular where you realized that, like, was it a slow, uh, a slow, like, adding up of things that got you to that uh, graffiti to one side and outdoors, here I come. Um, yeah, actually, I met these young, I was maybe about 18 at that point, and I met these young graffiti painters in a train, or like I, I could spot them straight away because they're painted on their clothes. Um, but anyways, I like said, hey, hello and stuff. And then they said, oh, like I told them my name, my, my writer name. And uh, they were like, oh, you are, you are a hero and stuff and, and things like, you know, you're the coolest one and stuff. And then <laughs> I kind of realized, ah, oh, you know, my great dream of becoming a, a cool graffiti painter, you know, it, it's kind of, you know, com coming uh, to life, you know, coming to fruition. And then um, 
after that, you know, I started reflecting, okay, maybe I, I've done what I wanted with it. And like, don't, can't I express, in, inspire more people than just, you know, like young kids uh, running around uh, making trouble? <laughs> kind of um, and that, that's kind of, uh, I thought, okay, I, I need to do something else, you know? Wow. Okay, cool. So you, at Jeepers, that's quite cool, isn't it? At such a young yeah. age to have peaked at a certain thing and then be able to move on to a new thing to go and excel at. Yeah, yeah, but it took me like three years or something, you know, but like I was still painting and stuff, but then, you know, like slowly, you know, I'm not that fast. You know? <laughs> do, you, do you still paint today? Uh, no, not really. No, I, I do like, I work with graphics every day and I do uh, videos as well. And so yeah, but, like, I'm, I'm very creative every day. So I, I don't really need that, that, that thing anymore, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it was good fun, you know? Um, but but I thought you know yeah I can spend my my powers for uh, greater things. Uh, but I would say what it really taught me was that if you uh, set a goal um, and work towards it, uh, you you can achieve it. You know uh, that uh, I got that confirmed in a young age, and I think uh, that was very valuable. Mm. So as you were going into the outdoors, what was the um, what was the initial goal that you had in mind? Did you have a a particular trip? or something you wanted to achieve or a destination to go work in what was the sort of thought in your head um no i didn't have that many plans but I, like after that half year course i thought okay i need to challenge myself so i went on this uh, 30 13 day solo hike in the swedish mountains i wanted to see a brown bear uh, and so i went to this area where there's supposed to be brown bears um i didn't see any but i i caught a lot of trout and um, had a great time but then like <laughs> after after 13 days i kind of started started to feel ah it, it's getting a bit boring you know i'm, I'm kind of you know it would be nice if there was some other people i could share this uh, adventure with and that's how i got into guiding um so i went to venezuela where i got a, a job there as a like an adventure guide Mm. I did all these trips, uh, both for VIP uh, like customers and also for these uh, groups of young people who wanted to, um, yeah, learn Spanish and have adventure. And I was the guide, you know. So I took them kayaking and and all that stuff and hiking and yeah, it was an amazing experience. And this was back in two thousand and six, you know, when Hugo Chavez, this. Um, socialist uh, president was there you know so it's mm. quite an interesting time to to experience uh, you know the country you know how it changed um, so so that was really rewarding um but after kind of yeah doing that for two years i i felt ah you know you know like you've been a guide as well as far mm. as i know and you know like when you take people on on tours what it's about is giving your you know customers like the best experience of their life you know that was my goal you know i wanted them to like you know unforgettable great experience really challenging and, and fun you know but but the challenge for me of course as a guide is to you know give everybody a great time but also challenge the individual uh, to their mm -hmm. uh, you know capabilities right um and uh, after doing that for two years, I, I became uh, really good at it in all uh, modesty. Uh, but after two years, I, I thought, uh, like, okay, uh, I'm not really challenging myself anymore. It's, it's always about, you know, challenging all of, other people. Um, so although I had done, like, a few um, adventures in Venezuela on my, my own, uh, I thought, okay, uh, I need to do it in another way. Um, and then I thought, okay, how can I combine creativity with the... Uh, my love for the outdoors and you know sharing that venture and that's how i came into came uh, to this realization to uh, do adventure films <laughs> so yeah yeah so so that was uh, kind of how i got into doing yeah all these adventure films and uh, yeah you've, you've got a bunch thought, of them hey you've got awards and you've got all sorts of things it's like i was very very impressed when i went through all your stuff i was like wow um there's a guy from denmark making cool films like this i didn't know those guys were about that's a superb <laughs> oh thanks man uh yeah yeah but um i'm, I'm really glad that uh yeah yeah like you received it well and, and when i did my first uh kayak film uh, it was also received well so that also gave me you know like the, the motivation to do more um mm. 
so and and there wasn't like there were weren't that many uh, stick hacking films around back then. There was like all these uh, "This Is the Sea" mm. movies by Justin uh, Kurgan, right? Um, so I, I wanted to do something like you know similar in, in Danish. Um, so at first I did one film, you know, just to a small island off uh, Copenhagen, and then um, I thought, okay, uh, you know, solo going solo and filming that that's fun, but. Um, you also need to have uh, some more people in your film, you know, or else it becomes a bit boring. <laughs> um, so I, I teamed up <laughs> with one, one of my uh, friends, uh, Kai Polanyak, this uh, German guy actually who lives in Denmark. Um, and we did this um, other film where we paddled to an island called Bonholm in the Baltic Sea, um, where there's this uh, big one day crossing. I think it's like 35 kilometers as far as I recall. Uh, and there's quite big seas there. so. So like there weren't any Danish people or Germans who have done it uh, before. Mm. So we thought, okay, that's that's a good way to, uh, you know, uh, create a bit of a news worse in this, uh, like a bit of buzz about like our journey, you know. So it's mm. like out of the ordinary. Um, so we won uh, uh, the first prize uh, for, for that film, the first uh, adventure film award, um, and that was uh, yeah amazing. Uh, and that uh, like inspired us to do a second film where we paddled around Denmark in sea kayaks. Uh, that's a journey of um, 1,200 kilometers. Um, and and the um, and you, you go like you know uh, the beginning of of the um, journey is is uh, through the North Sea, so it's it's quite uh, uh, rough uh, waves there, uh, even mm. in summer. Um, but but yeah, that was a great journey as well. Normally it takes 26 uh, days. It took us uh, 38 days because we had the wind against us for two weeks in the oh. beginning. <laughs> yeah, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, like uh, you know how it is paddling against the wind, right? So uh, exactly how it is paddling. We went. Um, I went around <laughs> Scotland in a sea kayak um, a few years ago, which is about about the same distance as you as Denmark, really. And I remember one day on the north coast of Scotland, I crawled out of my tent, looked at the sea, and I went, oh, I just give up. And I crawled back into my tent, got in my sleeping bag, and went back to sleep again. It's just... <laughs> oh. it's, you've got to be a certain yeah. sort of person to enjoy that sadistic, like, paddling against the wind and doing it day in, day out. It's sadism. Tell me, Abdul, how do you yeah, manage, yeah. Um, like... Filming something is actually uh, more complicated than people realize. Now, I, I know this because I've tried it on many occasions myself. Like, how do you manage that, even with two of you getting enough quality footage to actually pull something together at the end and tell a story? And, um, you know, when you're scared, you, it's probably the time you least want to get the camera out, but probably the time you most need to get the camera out. Like, how do you manage all that? Yeah, but uh, it's but that's uh, yeah training, right? And um, and you need to uh, have days where you say, okay, today I'm not filming. Uh, I think that's very important because I was like, uh, you could have the camera out all the time, right? Um, and you also have to be strategic with the like use of uh, battery power and all that stuff. Um, and then like if you're doing it from a, a sea kayak, you know where the waves are, you know, <laughs> spraying in all the time. It, it's really uh, challenging, yeah um so but but that that came you know like i accumulated some experience um um and as you say you know like it's when the times uh look uh looks the worst or like when it's really tough that's when you <laughs> should get the camera out you know and start filming um when you're like you know in a you know really bad mood and just need to bend or like if 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 you like, you know, have a quarrel with your buddies, you know, like that's when you get the camera out. <laughs> have, a um, the, have a grumble to the camera. And it's, it's yeah. hard as well, isn't it? Because like the camera, uh, especially with sea kayaking or sailing for that matter, that the camera like flattens the ocean. It may, like you can be in these seas where your heart's pumping and you're like, whoa, this is scary. You get the camera out and you film it. And then when you put it on your laptop or go to edit it, you're like, oh, that's, that's not as big. So I often find with, with filming on with water that it's quite hard to get like decent perspective for the people watching it. Because when, when they see a sea that they think is quite big, you and I have been terrified. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it's so true. <laughs> like, do you have any answers? I mean, I suppose to ha how to get that across to people. Oh yeah, definitely. I think uh, like either uh, a bit taller mounting of your camera, either in the front or like in the back, is is uh, very good. You know, like if you have your let's say GoPro on on a mount, you know, like mm. maybe a meter meter high or something. Uh, or like filming other people and have them film you, uh, you know, from from the what do you say, almost water level, right? So you get the waves uh, in between you, right? Mm. Um, so you, so you get kind of a because you need that perspective of of uh, another person or like of the kayak and then the wave, right? To just get an idea of how tall they could be, uh, mm. but there also need to be some distance between the the paddlers because. Um, you know, sometimes waves are long, right? So it is kind of, you know, you need to have um, the peak of the wave so it like covers the whole person uh, <laughs> on the kayak, right? <laughs> well, because I, I often think, what, you know, we, we've, uh, you've done some credible, uh, amazing expeditions. I've done a few uh, all right expeditions. Um, and like the expedition itself is only one part of the equation, isn't it? Because you've got to have the idea you then got to go, well, not, you've got to like build up to the idea. Then you're going to go and do the idea. And then so many trips, like one of my, I don't have very many regrets, but I've done some really cool trips where I just went and did the trip. And I didn't, I've never really spoken about it, written about it, filmed it, anything. And um, th there's a lot more involved than just having an idea, finding some cash, going to Papua New Guinea and getting a canoe. I mean, it's not quite that simple, is it? <laughs> no, no, not at all. Uh, but uh, as a start, I would say, you know, it's like you don't have to uh, register everything you do. And I think like I've had so many great experiences in the outdoors that I haven't registered. And it's great to, you know, just be there and be in it and not have to worry about how can I present this experience to other people. Um, but uh, like what I've, I've, uh, I've come to this uh, philosophy, um, which I'm still working on, but like uh, redefining adventure. Um, so, so like kind of what I want to do with, with these adventures is that um, I, I want to kind of uh, create a new perspective, uh, kind of get away from this uh, old uh, colonial trope of, you know, like, ah, uh, you know, a white man running out in the wild, you know, seeing uh, crazy things, right? <laughs> um, so, so I came up to like these points like I think you know you should make uh, the adventure uh, accessible like there should be um, some, some uh, takeaways from it something some, some, something that the people can um, implement in their own life their daily life you know some, some kind of like you, you learn something from this adventure right um, secondly I think you should see the adventure through um, uh, the lens of different cultures so it's not only like you coming, commenting on like all that stuff going on or like these people you meet, but you also hear their um, kind of perspective and, and experience, right? Like with these, uh, I, I sailed around New Guinea with these three Papua New Guinean sailors. And of course, like they had their own experience. And I've written this book about our adventure, Saltwater and Spear Tips. And um, in that book, I'm also trying to share like their experience of, of these uh, you know things and encounters um, that that we we had, mm. uh, and 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 finally, I think you need to do the adventure for a greater good. There needs to be like a higher purpose uh, with this uh, thing you're doing, because I'm thinking if you put together like if if you have the skill uh, to put together like a great project, a great expedition, then I think uh, you know it, it should be about something beyond yourself. Um, not least because also if, if, if you are doing something for a higher purpose, you are also more likely to persevere when the disaster strikes, right? Mm. <laughs> uh, so it's not only about, you know, like boosting your own ego, you know, it needs to be more than that, I think. Um, so that was kind of, you know, kind of how I felt when, uh, when I went on with this uh, New Guinea idea. That's quite a big change in the attitude towards adventure. Um, I've, what you've just said in that last part about a higher purpose behind the adventure, like a, a reason beyond just doing it. We think back um, not so long ago, the, the only purpose of adventure expeditions was to get to the highest peak the fastest. Um, I don't know, paddle around the island the quickest, whatever it, whatever it might be. That was the, it was like, 
height, speed, distance, you know, those were the, the things. Um, but I've noticed over the past few years how, how that's moved to actually, um, I, I'm doing this, yes, to do something new and something amazing, but actually it's about, I don't know, for in, my, in my case, inspiring other people to get in the outdoors so that they can develop a love for it and therefore look after it. Like that's my like little hidden philosophy. But that's, that's quite new, isn't it? I don't know. Our original, who are the famous, the famous uh, Admundsen maybe, is he Danish? Like those guys who are going to the North Pole. Uh, Norwegian. The first. Say again? Yeah, Norwegian, Amundsen, uh, Norwe Norwegian. Norwegian. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, what, like did, he, did he have a higher purpose, do you think? Or do you think he just wanted to get to the North Pole first? I think it was just a North Pole first, right? Yeah, and then of course, you know, having a great adventure probably, but uh, uh, and then maybe there was like some scientific reason for it as well, probably. Uh, but it's also, yeah, like the world is changing, right? And you know, there's a need for for something more or something else. It's uh, like, of course, people should go out and have a great time in the outdoors. Uh, but I think you know, when you put together like a great big project you know you kind of have some kind of a responsibility to actually make it about like more than yourself because if you also have this great platform to actually you know you know share some something you know with other people and give people something like uh, when we uh, sailed around new guinea like we wanted to um, uh, debunk all these uh, negative uh, stereotypes about papua new guinea piracy uh, cannibalism uh, you know, tribal war and corruption, all that stuff, you know? Like, we wanted to tell a positive story about the island. Um, and we ended up, like, uh, like these, uh, the sailors I sailed with, they're now, uh, like, uh, national heroes and uh, inspiring new generations in Papua New Guinea, right? So, um, and, and that was also what got us through in the end that, you know, we could see that this journey, you know, it just got support from all people all the way around the island, right? Mm. Um, and that was really beautiful um, yeah so there needs to be a purpose yeah that is incredible now you mentioned piracy and I saw with your book that you mentioned piracy and I'm just wondering like is there pirates did you experience them do they look like Jack Black um, do they have par parrots on their shoulders I don't know what, what was your experience did you no but the yeah, so there's like uh, different parts of the um, Papua New Guinea, especially that we were warned about pirates and uh, where we started the sailing from in Milne Bay, there's also uh, piracy. Um, and, and these pirates, it's like, that's what's so, um, what do you say, like scary about it is that it, it's just like normal uh, young guys coming in a fiberglass dinghy, you know? So you don't know if it's like just transport of people uh, or if it's like, you know, some young guys who, you know, got the, you know, uh, bush knives and then like maybe some guns as well, right? That, that's going to board your canoe and uh, <laughs> and rob you. Uh, actually, sorry, I'm laughing. It's nothing to laugh about. You know, it's, it's really dangerous. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, but like, you know, they, they jump aboard and, you know, cut people with these bush knives and chuck them in the water, right? And then they run off with the with the with the, uh, the fiberglass thing yeah maybe they just take the engine and like sink the thingy right so um, so yeah that, that was uh, you know a big worry and I was sailing with these three Papua New Guinean sailors and they were really paranoid like when we started the journey they were like oh this is so dangerous um, so I, I thought okay I've got to figure it out because um, this journey like it was undertaken in a traditional sailing canoe. Mm. So I thought, okay, we're, you know, we're just, we're going to blend in with the locals with this traditional sailing canoe. Um, but I hadn't uh, considered that it's only in this tiny part of Papua New Guinea where they use these sailing canoes. And the first day we left that area and then like <laughs> everything that came by and saw this weird uh, vessel on the sea, they, you know, they wanted to go close by to see what was going on, right? <laughs> So, and these sailors were like, ah, oh, dinghy coming, dinghy coming, you're like, to our hide, hide, you know, and then like, I would have to hide in the canoe because, you know, they're afraid that if uh, these uh, uh, dinghy drivers, they saw that there was a white guy in the canoe, there might be some money, you know, expensive equipment. Mm -hmm. So, um, so in the beginning, yeah, the sailors wanted me to hide every time. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Did you actually pirates though? That's the burning question. 
Uh, sorry? Did you actually get to meet any pirates? Uh, I don't know, not really. Yeah, we, we, I met a pensioned pirate. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and, <laughs> and I, I think, I suspect one of my sailors maybe also had been into some trouble uh, one time or two. Um, but, uh, but we were hijacked uh, in the middle of the night by this dinghy, um, which we found out they were fishermen, uh, luckily. Uh, but, but they t took us, like, um, started uh, pulling us um, into what shore in the middle of the night, you know, and we didn't know where they were bringing us and stuff. And, yeah, <laughs> it was really, and they were really drunk as well, so that was uh, really worrying. Um, but, the, but we ended up in this small village and then like the villagers came and they're like hey drunk people uh, go home you know <laughs> we'll take care of these uh, of these strangers um. so where did, where did this idea of Papua New Guinea come from like what, what was the point that what point where you were like hey look there's an island there that's got a really bad reputation and they've got sailing canoes um, where does it start um yeah, I've always been fascinated by the island since I was a little kid. There's this Danish explorer called uh, Jens Bjerg, who just uh, passed away. Um, and he was um, like uh, uh, one of these uh, like early journalists, what do you say, like that uh, registered some of the last, uh, what do you say, tribes in, in Papua New Guinea before um, like the Australian, uh, you know, uh, colonizers, they came to the villages and put up uh, you know out the outposts and stuff like mm. that um so i've been seeing his films when i was a kid and read the books and things like that so i thought okay this is an amazing place so i always dreamt about going there um so af after these uh, these uh, kayak films I, I thought, okay, now I got the experience and the skill to go on a, on a great expedition right um and then I thought, first, I want to do a kayak expedition around the, all the island of New Guinea because it had never been done before, right? But then I thought, ah, okay, maybe I should do it in a traditional sailing canoe instead. Because then uh, I'm not only telling a story about uh, like a white guy in a fiberglass kayak coming to this uh, you know, remote village, right? Now, <laughs> now I have some people with me who can help tell the story and, and be part of the story. Plus, I would learn so much more about the, you know, the culture if I'm sailing in a traditional vessel with some uh, local people. Mm. So that's kind of how, you know, it came about. Um, and so I had this uh, dream for, I think, like five years or something like that, you know, and I did the kayak films and I had this thing in the back, in the back of my head. And then, yeah, after I've done the, the Denmark, around Denmark thing, I thought, okay, whether it's uh, 38 days or if it's half a year, you know, I can, I can do a great expedition. A <laughs> uh, little bit, I know. <laughs> that was in for some serious uh, <laughs> trouble. Um, I was say, when, when you started the idea, when you, you uh, were you aware when you started just how long it was going to take to get all the way around the island? No, I, I thought I could do it in half a year. Like I thought, okay, if if I do it like uh, like in in a sea kayak, you know, I, I you know I kind of calculated, okay, it's like. Uh, Three, uh, so 6,300 kilometers around the island, uh, like I should be able to do it in, in 30 days, right? Um, but um, no, no, in, in half a year, I've got to say, able to do it 30, 30 days with an engine on the back <laughs> of the kayak. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, so ha half a year should be possible, right? Yep, if you do like an, an average, like an average of like 30, 35 kilometers a day. Um, but um, but but then uh, yeah, like we had all these obstacles, and it ended up taking uh, thirteen months and twenty one days. <laughs> um, That's great. And so you, yeah. So if I, unless I'm wrong, you went through one or two monsoon seasons whilst going going around them. I mean, uh, yeah, in, into yeah through one monsoon monsoon season, and then like through the southeasterlies. Um, so first I had the northwest northwest winds against me and then uh, against us and then afterwards there was southeast uh, winds against us and they just blow constantly um 
so it was yeah i was so messed up it, it totally put off uh, like my my whole plan uh, so yeah just to outline the geography for for people who's not that savvy on the on the new guinea so it's like this uh, elongated island uh, above uh, australia and uh, it's the second biggest uh, island in the world uh, after greenland and uh, uh, people there they speak more than uh, yeah a thousand languages more or less um, wow. on the island yes yeah, so, um, so there's all these different uh, you know tribes uh, and cultures there so it's really interesting and they have the second largest um, forest in the world a uh, rainforest um, depending on how you uh, measure it and they have uh, I think it's like uh, eight percent of the population live in you know out in the bush <laughs> um, so it's, it's it's not very developed um, so it, it's it's very um, you would say like there's some very beautiful nature there uh, it's very wild um, in many parts uh, so and and then what I planned to do was to start in the easternmost point of the island it, it looks like a big bird so I started like at the tail of the bird actually and then I, I went the, up um, uh, northwestward uh, towards uh, the the border uh, into uh, West Papua. So uh, the eastern part of the island is called Papua New Guinea. The western part is called West Papua and is uh, Indonesian uh, territory. Okay. Um, yeah. And 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 uh, so and West Papua is is quite hard to travel through. You need to have a lot of permits. There's a lot of uh, bureaucracy and and things like that. Um, so. So, so I knew it would be like the geography would be a big challenge, especially in the north coast, because uh, there's uh, very steep cliffs and big waves coming in from the Atlantic. And then um, also like there's also what do you say, all these problems with uh, bureaucracy and so forth um, uh, on, on the western part of the island. And then on the southern part of the island, there's like these very, um, um, what do you say, like flat waters, like full of the mud flats and mangroves full of the uh, saltwater crocodiles um, and then you come to the Torres Strait between uh, <laughs> uh, the island and uh, Australia where like you have these uh, like a lot of currents running through from the, the South Pacific and the Indian Ocean so there's like a lot of stuff going on plus there's also a lot of uh, uh, what do you say like um, um, a lot of the uh, tectonics um, what do you call that uh, volcanoes and, and things like that Wow. Yeah, earthquakes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we had a couple of earthquakes there as well uh, while I was there. Um, so a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> a very interesting place. Um, so yeah, so the plan was to yeah go uh, northwestward, um, but then I got um, delayed on the border to uh, to West Papua, and then um, yeah yeah like I had to wait for three months because I didn't have the right papers. Uh, one of the sailors he decided to go home, and then. Uh, yeah, then like my great plan about like following the the wind season, like mm. you know, the, just totally messed up, and yeah, suddenly we had to sail against the northwest monsoon, <laughs> these big uh, big waves uh, coming up from the Atlantic, you know, um, headwind, and yeah, so it's a huge challenge, and that's partly also why we're like so delayed. Um, uh, tell me about yeah. the canoe. Did you make the canoe? Buy the canoe? How do you go like? And find a traditional uh, Papua New Guinea canoe. Yeah, um, they're, they're really amazing, amazing vessels. So um, these canoes are just like it's it's a dugout tree trunk. Um, ours were nine meters long, and then it has an outrigger, like a uh, like a pontoon, and then you have like a little deck where you can you know sit and rest and have your stuff, um, and you can all sit in the canoe, and then it has the, a sail. I don't know, maybe like behind me, you can see, you can see the canoe here actually on, on the back uh, drop here. So the, uh, and the canoe is actually like this beautiful metaphor of the uh, contemporary uh, Papua New Guinea, because it's a mix of these uh, ancient uh, methods of, of, of building a canoe, but still uh, with new materials, like uh, the sail is made of a lightweight uh, tarpaulin <laughs> and the, the outrigger is, is tied with the fishing line. Uh, so in, in that regard, it, it's it's a, this a funny funny mix of, of old and new. Mm. And the, the cool thing about this canoe, besides that it, it's really seaworthy, it's super quick. Uh, it's also that um, you know if something breaks, you can fix it very easily. Um, 
uh, so so it was, it was to great great the the vessel and then we had two different sails we had like a big one for fair weather and then we had a smaller one for for like heavy seas and, and strong winds and uh, the, the only problem with this canoe is that uh, it can tip over <laughs> so you, you have to be a bit uh, bit careful um, mm -hmm. and also the outrigger um the, the pontoon that kind of supports the the main um, uh, the, the main canoe, you know, the pontoon out on the side can also kind of get waterlogged. You know, it, it sucks water over time. So you need to put it on land once in a while and then you need to uh, dry it out. Um, so uh, so the canoe was uh, actually three years old when, when I bought it from this uh, old guy. It was actually the uncle to uh, one of the three sailors I was sailing with. And he had this old canoe, that a three-year-old canoe that he had been using for shark fishing. And, uh, shark fishing, he, he, excellent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> a bit less, uh, a bit more sharks in those waters now. Uh, but uh, no, no, like the, the, the problem is, is not like the locals catching sharks. The problem is like these big, um, uh, you know, indu industrial ships coming in with these long lines uh, catching the sharks really, in these waters. But um, yeah, so we, we bought the canoe of him and then, uh, yeah. Yeah, fixed it up and then we were just uh, ready to go <laughs> something interesting strikes me about this uh, expedition of yours is that in in most expeditions you can train and qu in quite a linear mindset like your sea kayak expedition around Denmark you can learn to be a good sea kayaker then you go do your expedition like but, but the actual training for what you've done around Papua New Guinea like to become competent enough to not kill yourself actually is a combination of millions of different things all coming together from different aspects like you've got to be uh, a, a competent third world traveler to go do it like that's part of like what you need to the the mix up of things do you know what i mean um because yeah. because it, it's it's like everything from cultures to weather to the outdoors to the sea to um, language barriers to pirates there's so many different bits and pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that have to come together to do something like this and survive um. <laughs> yeah and, and you need to have some really good uh, local sailors with you who can uh, save your life once in a while <laughs> tell me more is that is that a reality for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah no so so uh, you're you're totally right you know it's it's a mix of many things and like i couldn't really prepare for it you know but um, of course I've been sailing a bit you know as a kid and like sailed in the Caribbean and crossed the Atlantic as well with a sailing boat uh, and then you know had a bit of background in the kayaking as you say like uh, third world the traveler as well um, so so I so I had had those experiences right but um, but but like I, I was a total novice um, and these three sailors I was sailing with like they were like in the prime of, they were a bit older than me. I was 35. The youngest was, yeah, 35 as well. And then like one was uh, 37, the other one was like 41. So they were kind of, um, uh, maybe I shouldn't introduce them. So the first one was uh, Job CA, and then the, the two others were Justin and Sana Coley, and um, they were brothers. <clears throat> and um, they were all like remarkable sailors, and they had won this. Um, uh, for like they had all won, won the first place in this uh, sailing competition that they have every year in in that region in Middle mm. Bay, uh, in Papua New Guinea, uh, and and they were like, yeah, yeah, we we we're ready to go on a great adventure with you, and like we can uh, teach you how to sail and stuff, um, and and they were motivated by uh, actually uh, leaving a legacy for their children. You know, for them it's like uh, you know sailor owner, it's like. like in that culture, it's about you know who's the best uh, canoe sailor, yep. right? Um, so that was kind of their motivation. So uh, we agreed that I would send money home for their wives uh, every month. So like you know there was something for the family and the community, the part of. And then um, yeah, we just uh, got started, right? Um, but the first uh, the first uh, day we we set out like with the canoe packed. Um, you know, as soon as the sail was pulled up, it was all already late in the season, right? So when the sail was pulled up, like the big crack just ripped it. <laughs> this plastic sail, right? And then uh, we just uh, we just sh started shooting outwards, right? 
and there was all these winds coming down from the mountains. So it was really a, a rough going. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and then like we shot, shot onwards and then after an hour, then like I, I asked a job, one of the sailors, hey, uh, can I go to the outrig? I just need to like uh, set the GoPro right. And he's like, yeah, but go out and go quick. So I run out in the front of the canoe and out on the front of the outrigger. And in the same the outrigger just digs into a, a big wave, right? And water just starts spilling in over the deck into the canoe. So the whole front just starts filling with water, right? And I'm thinking, oh no, first day we're gonna sink. <laughs> like, so I just run back, <laughs> back in the other end of the canoe to counterweight, like all the water for, uh, like fussing in, right? And uh, Justin, he lets go of the sail and, and you know, like there's all this commotion and we just start bailing, right? And like, you know, the, the canoe is kind of gets like more or less upright again and we just start bailing water out of the canoe. And one of the only like modern things I had installed on this canoe, because I wanted it all to be traditional, but one of the only modern things was this hand operated bilge pump. <laughs> and I promise you that bilge pump came to work <laughs> on the first day. Uh, oh, it was so good. Um, <laughs> so we got the canoe emptied and then, uh, yeah, we just shot onwards, right? Um, so that was quite a start. And, then on the second day, another disaster struck, and that was because uh, <laughs> we were crossing this uh, big bay, and there was maybe like 20 kilometers across, um, and we're out in the middle of nowhere, and there's like this big, uh, big uh, winds already, um, and then I'm, I'm sitting on, on, the, on like the gunwale of, of the canoe, like I've seen the canoe sailors does, right, so I'm sitting there. And then suddenly, like, there's a wave, and I just tip back or backwards, right, <laughs> and fall into the sea. <laughs> so, like, ah, oh, you know, I try to grip the canoe, but it's just, like, flying on onwards, right? So, I, you know, I get under, the, like, a wave and, you know, my hat and my sunglasses. I need to get all that in control. And then I, uh, you know, come up again, and I can just see the canoe, you know, just, like, shooting off. I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> But then I realized, ah, we got two lines hanging after the canoe, you know, with two rapalas. Mm. So I like, you know, I'm like, you know, trying to pull my legs up and look down for these big hooks if these big barbs are gonna like pierce me. Um, but <laughs> luckily, I don't, <laughs> I didn't get hit, right? Um, and then I can see, oh, they stopped the, the canoe, so I start swimming towards the canoe, and I, I get up on the deck, and then the, uh, I look at the sailors, and they actually look quite shocked. They're like. Hey Tor, from now on, you just stay inside the canoe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was kind of a, a wake up call. <laughs> like um, I thought, okay, this is like this is really hard call. I, I yeah. thought, you know, okay, I you know I, I know a few things about sailing and paddling and stuff. You know, I can learn this in in a week or two. But I realized, okay, these are like super, you know, skilled sailors that have done it all their life and this is like you know really hardcore conditions already um and then uh, later on <laughs> that day uh, i spoke with the sailors and then um, they told me that they had been into uh, into town and speaking with the local tourist office and this uh, tourism officer he has uh, he had prepped these sailors telling them like now you're going as uh, traveling with this uh, white man Dim dim, they call they call white people uh, dim dims. In, okay. <laughs> so you're going traveling with this uh, dim dim. Uh, so you need to take good care of him because if he dies or something bad happens to him, you know it falls back on you and your family, and it also falls back on tourism here in uh, Mill Bay. You know. Hmm. So so um, they were really worried about like losing the dim dim. You know. <laughs> uh, uh, so, and I just started feeling like, oh man, I'm not this cool expedition leader, you know, and as brothers will, you know, conquer this island. I'm just this tourist that they're just like taking on a, on a ride until he gets tired of it. <laughs> That's crazy. How, how did your relationship with those guys change as you spent like 13 months, almost 14 months with each other? Because they were obviously almost complete strangers when you first got in the canoe on that first day, and uh, something changed. Like a lot changes between humans over that time. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, good question. Um, so in, in the beginning, yeah, they were just like polite and friendly. And, uh, but I, I had a bit of squirmish with, with one of them, um, which I also talk about in my book in length. Uh, um, but, and he actually ended up leaving uh, by, by the border there when we went to Vanimo and had to wait for three months. <clears throat> but um, uh, I, I slowly learned the ropes and yeah, we became like uh, brothers in the end. And, and uh, yeah, we, it, it was just like uh, being with the, you know, your great mates on, on a great adventure, really. Like if you go with your mates and like, hey, let's, let's go camping, you know? Hmm. And it was just like that every day for, yeah, <laughs> almost 14 months. And uh, like every day it was just, although, you know, some disaster struck almost every day, it was just, wow, man, this is amazing. <laughs> And uh, so they they, uh, they stopped worrying about drowning the dim dim or something like that after a while. Oh uh, yeah 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 they did you know like I kind of had to prove myself. <laughs> but uh, actually after the <laughs> one of them he uh, he went home um, you know and we had these no northwest monsoon against us there was nothing to do but for for me to really pick up um, you know like I really had to to put in my my share of the work because before that there hadn't really been room for me doing that and they were already the experts and i was already busy like uh, filming it all and uh, you know trying to find sponsors and blah 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 um so yeah slowly like you know i learned the, the ropes and in the end in the end we we're just like yeah we would just work like clockwork we were, we were such a great team and yeah, I learned so much from these uh, sailors because, you know, they could just read the water and the sea and, uh, like, you know, the winds and, and everything. It was, yeah, it was so amazing. What, what next for those guys? Because they've, uh, they've circumnavigated their home island. They're, like, New Guinean heroes. What, what is, what's in their future? Have they got more sailing or are they chilling out or...? No, I, I don't think you could keep them on the islands. You know, they, they like they they love sailing and fishing and all that. So so they're um, you know they're out uh, sailing around the uh, different islands in the area and, and telling uh, the story of of our great journey. You know, and probably laughing at uh, about me sometimes. Um, and then uh, like um, they're also um, getting into tourism, especially especially one of them, uh, Sanakoli. Uh, the youngest of the brothers, he, he has uh, like tourists, not in, uh, anymore because of the, the pandemic, but uh, he was starting getting tourists through the tourism uh, office in mm. Allotown. Um, so, and he's a great fisherman as well, so like a great guide. And, uh, so, but it was funny because that was kind of also what I tried to get them into uh, after the journey, like, hey guys, you know, and I tried to teach them something on the way. Yeah like during the journey because i thought okay man like you get some skills and then like after mm. this story here like you know p wants to go sailing with you and stuff uh, but after the um, the voyage they were a bit like ah oh, we just want to go home to our families like we don't care about that tourism and stuff and things like that but uh but but now after you know a bit of time they're like yeah totally into it and the other one um, justin he he's also building a guest house and yeah and hey i'm telling you they're amazing those <laughs> islands it's just you know it hasn't been spoiled by by anything you know it's just yeah local people fishing there in their canoes and yeah mm. white sand beaches coconut palms and yeah very beautiful was there anything that um as you're going around papua new guinea anything that like disturbed you i mean i was on a beach back in january and i, I got I was quite disturbed by the sheer volume of plastic waste that had washed up on the beach is there anything of like man's impact that you think is doing damage to Papua New Guinea at the moment that people should be more aware of? Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, definitely like there's rubbish. Uh, but I think, you know, there's different types of uh, oceanic pollution. You know, there's the immediate, like, you know, coming from the actual mainland near. And then there's like, yeah, the stuff that's been uh, carried by currents. Um, but I could definitely see like there's a lot more pollution on the West Papuan side. Uh, simply because you know there's more uh, consumerism you know mm. people have more products and people throw them all out you know and in the in Papua New Guinea it's not <laughs> quite the same right but of course people also chuck things in the water there um, but I think like one shouldn't be too judgmental on, on the local people because you know it's, it's kind of like how they've always done you know if you have something like you drop it 
on the side of the canoe and it's only in recent years or like you know the last 50 years that they actually had something that weren't biodegradable kind mm. of to to throw out right um so so i think uh, it's important to keep that in mind as well uh but but yeah like you could see um like the reefs as well uh some reefs are being fished very hard and there's of course also like pollution from, from a bit of industry and, and things mm. like that but that's especially on the west Papua one side there's uh, quite a fair amount of uh, industry as well uh, mining and uh, you know they have the the greatest uh, gold mine in the world uh, the grassberg uh, freeport the uh, grassberg mine oh, really in, in west Papua. yeah 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 so it's this like you can check it out on youtube it's this huge crater um and of course that has done a lot of damage to the like immediate uh, uh, surroundings and also yeah so yeah there's some conflict about that as well um but so like my my great dream for these sailors is that you know they can be uh, they already like inspiring young people but i would like to take them uh, around the you know papua new guinea you know so we also so we could have a fun adventure of course but um and then like show the film i'm working on i'm working on this film about our journey around the island uh, and i would love to take them um, on this uh, tour you know and then we could go to all the different schools and stuff in, in papua new guinea and, and show the film and you know the sailors could tell uh, tell the story of the voyage and, and things like that and then uh, yeah hopefully do some more adventures with them in, in the future as well uh, maybe some other countries with a sailing canoe or something ah uh, well, i was going to ask what's uh You've got your film you're working on now, um, but what's what's the next big thing? Yeah, like um, so things have changed a bit because of the pandemic, right? But I'm I'm in the center of uh, the Australian uh, desert, and it's it's an amazing place here. And I'd love to do something uh, with the yeah these cool cultures here and the youth. I think it's very interesting that it's kind of um, it's a bit like Papua New Guinea, you know, like. Uh, people live with one uh, one foot in the village or the bush and the other foot in, in the town, right? Uh, and I think uh, that kind of dynamic is very interesting. And I think it's interesting how people uh, navigate that. Uh, so I definitely like to do some adventure here. And it's also something new for me, right? I've always done like sea adventures or jungle adventures. But uh, this is just like the outback, um, which is so beautiful. And yeah, incredible, but a whole new, very harsh environment uh, to learn from and new people to learn from. So it's it's really interesting. Yeah, I don't think that the rest of the world often realizes just how big the center of Australia is, or even just how big Australia is. Like people think of Australia as this island in the southern hemisphere um, where you're just about to fall off the edge of the world. But when they think of an island, because it is an island, but when they think of it, when you think of an island, you think about something that's small and you could cycle around it or you know do something like that but australia is ginormous isn't it i mean it's ridiculously huge yeah yeah it's huge. it is actually the the smallest continent in the world and i like to tell that to australians because they're like no no it's the biggest island it's like no 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 it's the smallest continent <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyways it is it is massive and uh, you you can think about it like this you know you know people have populated the coastline right you know like the coast some most of the coastline more no not most of it but like parts of the coastline is populated but the center like nobody wants to live in there because it's it's just like big and it's dry and there's nothing you know except maybe a bit of mining and then yeah amazing uh, nature of course so what do you fancy doing in the center of Australia? Is there a, a big hike or a four by four trip or a, ma uh, a not marry a, a cultural thing? What's the what's the big idea? Or is there not one yet? Uh, yeah, but there's a few things like I would like to do some, uh, of course, like uh, learn some traditional knowledge from from uh, from some of these, uh, you know, uh, Aboriginal uh, cultures here. Um, there's uh, but there's also like a lot of uh, hiking like if you're into hiking wow man um right here by um there's this um uh, mcdonald ranges these uh, mountain ranges uh, around uh, alice springs here and you can go on this uh, uh trail um called the uh, what's called lara pinza trail which is this hike i think it's like 15 16 days you can do it in 
um, which is like some, some of the most stunning, um, yeah, uh, outback you can experience. Mm. You're kind of walking on on the ridge of these uh, of these mountains. So yeah, amazing views and uh, you know gorges with water in them and yeah, wildlife. Uh, yeah, so there's, of course, Australia have been destroyed by all these invasive species and like there's camels out here and uh, big uh, scrub bulls, as they call them, you know, like uh, these big, big cattle, mm. wild cattle and yeah, a lot of uh, wild stuff going on there. That's cool. So listen, um, so you've been around Papua New Guinea, that's a big idea and I, I'm pretty sure, having spoken to you now for a while, that you're going to have another big Papua New Guinea size trip at some point in time in your life but loads of people who listen to this have their big idea um, and for some people their big idea might be I don't know a four-day trip to go do something and other people have got this idea of I don't know walking the length of the Himalayas or something that's you know the size of your Papua New Guinea trip or bigger do you have any like advice that you can give to people who are sat there with that big idea now um, and don't know what to do next. Um, yeah, but like, if, if you have the idea, start um, reading into it, like uh, read some literature about where you want to go and then start telling people about what you want to do, you know? And then like, when you kind of verbalize it, then suddenly it becomes easier to take the next step. And then like, so I would say, you know, take it step by step, but yeah, have this uh, great dream and don't be shy about it. Like. Don't be shy about telling people about it. Um, uh, and, you know, it, it, it's, I think it's important to have, like, great dreams and, and aspire towards them. And, of course, it, it all depends on where you start and where you want to go. And there's no, no like, uh, right or wrong thing to do. I, I think it, what's important is that, like, you move on and evolve as a, as a human being, right? And that benefits you and the rest of the community as well. Mm. I think it's also important to realize, I think a lot of people believe that they're not good enough or don't know enough or they're not able enough to go do a big trip of some sort. And I generally think that you are never good enough and never ready enough to go and do a big trip. Like you learn, you learn 80% of what you need to learn. You actually learn once the trip started. Um, I, I, uh, I spoke with a, and I can't remember his name, he's a guy who skied um to the south pole <sighs> name's gone anyway he's like i was like what about fitness he said i really didn't want to do much fitness training before i left and i thought well that's a bit bizarre you're gonna be on skis with a big pulk towing uh, the sled behind you and he's like but rob i had to get so much body weight on me to kind of uh, sustain myself throughout the trip that if i'd have got fit i'd have been skinny with no body fat i'd have got freezing cold um <laughs> I was like, wow, there's a whole new concept of the idea of starting a trip, a big trip like that, and actually not really being, I'd, I'd always imagined you'd have to be like a, a marathon runner or something like of that level of fitness. And actually the answer is not. The answer is sort your headspace out and, and go learn what you need to learn on the way. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's very wise words. And that's also what's so rewarding about going on a big journey is because, yeah, you learn so much on the way. and you come home as a as maybe not a completely new person but you have gained so much uh, new insight and not least about yourself and your own capabilities so yeah people should just um you know i, th I think if, if you do a bit of like um uh, not necessarily training but like if if you kind of start in, in the smalls and kind of scale up slowly then you also build up a confidence um to actually take a big step uh, one day maybe right and do something crazy mm. how, how did you change as a person as you went around papua new guinea what's the what what's the new version of you because there was a version who started and a version who finished and they're going to be subtly <laughs> different what's the new what, what was that change um like i, I became a uh, person that became more like uh, open uh, and not so afraid of actually uh, exposing myself and my uh, my dreams you know um like I, I was a bit like worried in the beginning about telling people about this great dream of new guinea and stuff and in the end like i learned that hey if you have a great dream and a great project people really would love to hear about it and you know people will support you as well and i think uh, that that was a big thing um and then also, like, 
that thing about yeah bringing people together uh, it was also amazing like how people just you know everybody wanted to help us on this great journey like all these different communities um, um well it was amazing that yeah you can create uh, like a project that can bring uh, you know joy and happiness to so many people um, you could of course say like okay you're rocking up in a village you know with your canoe and then like you leaving the next day like what are you bringing to the, those people but you actually you know you're bringing a lot of stories and and they become part of the story and you know they can tell new people <laughs> coming to the village hey we had the canoe here and so in that way we were kind of a type of entertainment you know traveling this traveling band <laughs> coming right um and I, I thought that was really rewarding as well mm. um and then i also back realized back. like i'm sorry go. yeah sorry oh, i just realized i didn't need as much uh, shit that i have back home you know like so i also threw out a lot of shit when i came back home to Copenhagen. <laughs> <laughs> i was just about to say about 20 years ago i, I kayaked quite a long way on the white nile in uganda um and I'm pretty sure, and I was on my own, and I was, I'm pretty sure at some point in time, I was bumping into little, um, little African kids who I was the first real white man that they'd ever seen. Um, and I'm quite a big guy. I'm, I'm well, well, well over six foot. Um, and so I, there's this big white giant who arrives in their village at the end of the day, like it's this plastic whitewater kayak that comes up on the beach and all these funny clothes and the fact that I'm wearing clothes and that it was just, I, I became aware that I was going to be part of their story for the rest of their days. They were going to be like telling their grandchildren about the day that the white giants arrived on the beach. Do you know what I mean? It's that sort of, <laughs> the stories interweave and then separate, but they've never really separated completely because like those Papua New Guinean people who you maybe only met for 10 minutes you've actually, they're going to be talking about you for the next 60 years. Yeah, yeah, definitely, you know, and they were like part of a world record and like, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, as you say, with these kids, you know, when they like, oh, it's, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it must have been really funny. <laughs> and, and did you meet people going around Papua New Guinea who you were like the first white guy they'd ever seen or? Um, I, I think for, yeah, the kids, yeah, definitely, like. As often they would start crying, you know, the small ones. <laughs> and I, I'm not, and I'm not a very tall guy, so like maybe I'm not that handsome, you know. <laughs> maybe I look too scary. Look like a, a ghost coming out of the sea. <laughs> yeah, this white. Uh. <laughs> awesome. Um, uh, Dora, yeah. I want to just like, say thank you to you for a second. And um, thank you for inspiring the world to go and do big, crazy shit. Um, that's not, yeah. uh, that's like, that, that's, that's a really good thing, in my opinion, by the way. Big, crazy shit. I think too many people have ideas and dreams and they have a one day, maybe, um, thing going on. And um, people who are willing to go and take a risk, like put your future, your life, your finances, all those other things people care about to one side and go, actually, I'm going to go and make a difference in the world and show that something incredible is possible. Um, we, we need more of you. Um, so, so thank you so much for, for, for that. It's absolutely incredible what you've brought to the world. Um, if people want to come hang out with you, follow you, uh, I don't know, hike in the bush with you, where do they come and find you? What do they need to do? Ah, they can go to uh, Facebook and find me. Um, they can write the uh, Facebook uh, slash Action Thor or my name Tor Jensen and, and find me there. I'm quite easy to find, I think. Um, yeah, and also like read the uh, read my book Saltwater and Spear Tips about the world's first circumnavigation of the island of New Guinea in a traditional sailing canoe. Um, great book. <laughs> great book. Yeah, we we really like the author. Um, cool. So I'll put I'll put the links for all of those in the uh, in the in the notes for the show beneath here. Um, and if you're listening to this on Apple, then you'll need to go to We Get Outdoors Tribe to get the links. Because you know, Apple only lets you put like 400 characters in for a description for something. Ah, which basically means, hey, here's Thor F. Jensen. He's got a cool book. He's a nice guy, but we can't tell you any more about him. That's the Apple Podcast strategy. Um, yeah. So if you're listening on Apple, go to YouTube or to find us on Facebook, and you'll find Thor's uh, links there, or find him on Amazon. 
Well, sir, that's that's it for me today. I'm going to go and have some breakfast, and I guess you can step into your Friday afternoon. Cheers. I'll uh, go for a walk in the outback, mate. Yeah, mate, <laughs> you throw some prawns <laughs> on the barbie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, have a great day, Rob. Cheers, Lord. This episode is brought to you by the We Get Outdoors tribe, where your next adventure is just one click away. You can join this, the fastest growing outdoor group on planet Earth and become part of a tribe of like-minded outdoor enthusiasts, sharing your adventures, their adventures, trips and insights, and helping to ensure you plan and have the most perfect adventures. Click on the link in the description below to join for free right now.